Hope you can all see me okay. I'm actually spending the afternoon uh, down near our ancestral village uh, of Sanok or in Kitsilano and I'm here with, I'm my, here dog. with my dog. Yeah. And I've just got my, uh, just got the camera propped up here. So giving, uh, just wanted to open up from out here, but I don't know if Beth was gonna open up before me and say a few words. A little bit and then I'll uh, let you talk. Sounds good. I'm just contextualizing where I am. Okay. So we're just going to wait a couple minutes. Are you here? I guess we're good to go now. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual opening of Connected Knowledge. My name is Ali Bubard, and I'm the assistant curator here at the Bill Reed Gallery. Um, I'd first like to start off by acknowledging that the Bill Reed Gallery is located on the ancestral, uh, sorry, the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and we're so grateful that we're able to do our work on these territories. Um, so to start off, I will pass it along to Celia Joseph for our local welcome. Tanoya, Eok Tanaqueto, Eok Ta Iwan Ne Team Slenslane, Celia Joseph Quiansna, Stehe Alo, Qui Ankushamin, Ants Hopmish, Snanemo, British Jewish Amen, Floyd Joseph, Natkus Hopmish, Squataquamtensiam, A Eve Joseph, Slan Ashtach, Larry Joseph, Squataquamtensiam Amen. A Rose Thomas, Nathan Salcedo, Chenwa Slashba Elsh, Natqua Tan Hopmish, Ohomeo, Tasanak, Nata Aslewatos, Eta Ahamasquium Stalmo, Amen. On Chenwanaux, Quetli Beth Carter, Yuan Hot States Up, Nata Bill Reed Gallery. On Hotland Squalowin, Quinswa, Slash Elsh, Escoco, Tanoi, Apteet Seats. So, hello everybody. My given name is Celia Joseph, and my ancestral name is Tehealot. I come from the ancestral village of Stotmus up in the Squamish Valley. And my father, Chief Floyd Joseph, he comes from Squamish and Nanaimo. And then my mom is uh, of mixed British and Jewish ancestry. Uh, I just open up is speaking Squamish first as a protocol of these territories. We're told uh, to speak to our ancestors first whenever we gather to let them know what we're doing, to let them know that the people who have brought these gatherings together and brought all of us together wanted to follow the old ways and to talk to the host nations about the work that's being conducted in our territories. And, um, and Beth and I have, have a good close working relationship. Um, she's been a mentor of mine uh, as I navigate my different paths through life. And um, I worked at the Bill Reed Gallery under Beth and she's continued to be a support to me throughout my career. So I was really happy I am really happy to uh, come when she invites me to be a part of such amazing projects like this. Um, it's really touched, my heart feels really good today to be out in the sun and to see a Zoom filled with beautiful Stalmuch faces and um, some familiar faces and new ones. I can't wait to come into the gallery later and to see all of your work and to think about all the gifts that are passed down uh, from generation to generation through your fingers and through your minds and eyes. So uh, I just wanted to hold my hands up to you all for the work you do and to uh, welcome you to our Ahamasquiam, uh, our Musquiam and our Tsleil-Waut Oaths, our tsleil Tooth and our Squamish, Squamish territories uh, virtually. And I'm really, happy that our territories can host your amazing pieces and the amazing work that's being done in your exhibition. 
So uh, watch I feel, which in our language just means to walk gently and take care of each other. I know these times are trying and it is inspiring how people can still come together and be creative uh, during these times. So enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you so much, Celia. That was such a beautiful welcome. Um, so the Bill Reed Gallery is dedicated to showcasing contemporary Indigenous art, and we're so thrilled to have a show highlighting all of these Indigenous women artists. Um, so Hands of Knowledge is a collaborative show featuring, <clears throat> excuse me, featuring six contemporary Indigenous women artists, um, Patricia June Vickers, Dale Marie Campbell, Pearl Innes, Marie Oldfield, Kelly Clifton, and Arlene Ness. This show was developed by curator Tim Shen, Joanne Finlay. Um, so following the conversation with Joanne and the artists, we will be setting aside some time for a Q&A session at the end. So please, throughout the uh, course of the opening, you can feel free to put your questions into the chat and then we'll be able to answer them at the end. Um, and then for those who need it, we also have closed captioning um, just if you available if you need to turn them on. Um, so we also have a welcome recorded by Tim Chien artist uh, Sam Bryant. Um, so I will share that. Just showing, okay. <laughs> All right, just one second here. Samori, Sagaramana, Okay, get it.
Okay. All right. Um, so I'd also like to thank some of our sponsors for the show. So Canada Council for the Arts, BC Arts Council, Prince Rupert Community Arts Council, First Peoples Cultural Council, Council and the City of Vancouver. We would also like to thank Dahlia Yuen for her graphic design, Rory Guylander for his help with the installation, East Van Vinyl, and all of the Billery Gallery staff, board, and volunteers. Um, so I'd now like to invite Joanne Finlay uh, to talk a little bit about the show herself and what her process was behind the exhibition. Oh, you're muted, Joanne. You're muted, Joanne. <laughs> Thank you, Alia, and I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you to everybody for coming. And I just wanted to say a few words before we look at the work about how this all came together. I was actually at Pearl's house one day and I said, gee, you know, I read this article about how women artists don't get displayed in galleries across Canada very much. And if you're Indigenous, you really don't get seen. And I thought, you know, we should do something about that. Why don't we put a show together? So I asked Pearl, what do you think of that idea? And she said, I think it's a good idea. I said, well, just off the top of my head, I think I know five or six artists. So I just called everybody and they said, yeah, sure. So here we are, right? So we all have moments in our lives where either something gets in your craw or, hey, I don't think that's right, or something calls us to action. So that's how this show all came together was the fact that our women don't get seen in uh, galleries across Canada as much as they should, in my opinion. Now, in the last 10 years, there have been a lot of really good exhibits of women's work, though, I have to say. So I'm really glad to be part of that. Um, yeah, so the women, these are all women artists that I've worked with over the last 25 years of me being an arts administrator and a community organizer, or it's people that I have read their work, like Patricia, for instance, I was impacted by her written word, her poetry. So that's why I got her engaged. And then I looked at her work and went, wow, she has to be part of the show. So every one of these artists has something that they uh, Dale Campbell has been carving for over 30 years. She's the third generation of women carvers in Canada. Not everybody can say that. Kelly uses a lot of the Somalic language in her art, which I love that she incorporates our language because that's really an important part. Arlene is just so, the work she creates is fantastic. The, the, the stories that she brings forward and her knowledge is all, and Pearl is very, She's traditional and she does it because, you know, people use her work in ceremony. And I, I love that. And uh, Marie is the same. She weaves to see them dance. So these are all reasons that we came together as artists and curator to say, let's put something together that shows what we do and share it with people. And the, the idea was vision. Uh, initially, it was called Revision, regarding vision, 2020. And then COVID happened and well, you know what happened to the world then. So here we are in 2021 with a new focus, Hands of Knowledge, which is moving forward with the art. So um, I think that's about all I have to say about how it all started and how we got how we got here. What I'd like to do is start with uh, Patricia's, if that's all right, Alia, to start that part now or? Yeah, feel free, go ahead. Okay. So I'm not sure what the, what the format is to, are we going to look at the pieces while we're, okay, here we go. We have our pieces up on the screen. If Patricia, okay. can talk a little there bit. There we go. Yeah. Um, First, I want to say it's an honor to be with these beautiful women, and um, I'm, I'm grateful that this is happening. I think we need to celebrate more often. Uh, so this piece is a part of a soul catcher. It's an oil painting, 
And these two pieces, they're right side by side, the soul catchers are important, were, have been important to me in the healing journey. I'm a psychotherapist. And so painting has simply been a way to focus on the strength and in particular, the, the supernatural. Um, so this is another soul catcher piece. And then just beside this one, um, we, we heard a piece, a uh, dance song, and these are uh, three Samoygits dancing. And um, I, I first went to a feast when I was in Gitsan territory and I was an adult, had four children. So I came into the traditional ways, um, formal ways, let's say, later. Um, I didn't recognize it as tradition when I was a child, when my grandparents would come and live, live with us during the winter months. But I see now really clearly. So this is also an oil piece and it's about celebrating again, these ways that we have that are, are um, connected to deep wisdom. Yeah. Thank you. And next will be Dale Campbell. <clears throat> there we go. Hi there. I would like to say a few words before I get started. But first of all, my name is Dale Marie Campbell. And my tall tan name is Tostama, which means tall tan mother. I am honored to be in this show all of these very talented artists. I, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, both of my parents are from Telegraph Creek. Um, Peggy Adirka and Harry Campbell. Um, and as I, when I was younger, I grew up, I was hearing about different stories about Telegraph and that. And I thought, oh, wow, this is pretty interesting. And then when I was about 17, I started carving. I was very lucky to be taught by Frida Deasing and Dempsey Bob here in Prince Rupert. And um, around the same time, what happened was I got really interested in where I came from, my culture. I wanted to go back to Telegraph and start learning about my culture. I wanted to experience it. I didn't want to just hear about it. I wanted to experience it. So I went up there and I lived in a 10 frame, believe it or not. And um, I, I tried everything, fishing on the river with a net and hauling in a hundred sockeye a day. Uh, I went moose hunting, I went bear hunting and experienced those things. And I. The, the best thing that happened was I got to meet all my relatives, my great uncle that mushed the mail to Atlin uh, for his living. Uh, I got to meet my grandmothers. I heard the stories, the elders and the matriarchs, the stories that they had to tell about their lives. And through that, it gave me a real sense of who I was and where I came from. And to hear how my grandmother, for instance, bakes dozens of, of bread a day just to feed her 12 kids. And while her husband was out trapping, I mean, they struggled just to live, to eat. And by hearing about all these stories and all that, it really gave me strength. And it was just totally amazing. It, I, I was changed. I, I grew to, to be a, a strong person. And so anyways, I, when I first started with them, seeing them, they taught me how to do tool making and carving. And, and um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. it. I tried all kinds of creative stuff, like, you know, knitting, sewing, pottery, you name it, I tried it. But when I tried carving, it was just like this is it. This is what I want to do. And um, so 
I was very honored to be able to have two teachers. I got to work with Dempsey for three years on a one-on-one -on -one basis in his attic. <laughs> and then when they kicked me out and said, okay, girl, you're ready. That's it, no more for you. <laughs> but uh, part of my creative process is I draw everything out on paper and then, well, I find out what story I want to design my piece from. And then I draw it all out, figure it out, you know, looking at it forward, sideways. And then from there, I smudge myself, I smudge my wood, and I say a prayer that everything will turn out good and good energy will come out. And then I'll start, start my carving on that. <clears throat> so that is part of my um, creative process. And uh, I've I always felt like I was part, the artwork was uh, part past, present, and future uh, for my people because I came to realize that on the first total pole raising that I ever carved, helped carve, there were three people that carved it here in Rupert. And as I was dancing around the pole, as it was going up traditionally, I was in a state of euphoria and I went, oh my God, like I thought about it. What was that feeling? That feeling was that to that connection to the past, because I was doing something that was done hundreds of years before my time, and the present, and then the future. You know, it just it was totally amazing. So each piece that I that I work work with, it's like I'm sharing a story. Uh, a lesson, a feeling, and a part of myself. So when you see my artwork, a few, you get a feeling from it. And it's, it's because it's what I love what I do. And that's what you're feeling. Yeah. Well, and another part of my creative process that keeps me going on my artwork is the sheer challenge of it. Um, if I if I didn't find it challenging, because each piece that I do, I learn something new. So I'm forever learning something new, which is is what I love. Yeah. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. That's wonderful. Okay, so um, Arlene, we're going to move on to your work now. Oh, I don't get to say anything about my piece. Oh. Yeah, she can go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, okay. This one is titled The Man Who Married the Eagle. So the story goes in a short version that uh, there was this man that was thrown out of his village and he was walking along the beach and he picked up a seal skin, put it on and he went fishing and stuff. And then this uh, boatload of uh, fishermen came along and picked him up and took him back to their village. So what happened was uh, a woman there fell in love with him. And so he stayed and her brothers gave him an eagle skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he put that on and flew around and he hunted and fished and everything. And because his mother was kicked out of the village too, now he could provide her with the food. And how I interpreted the story is you can see on the, the face, the nose has transformed into a beak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's beautiful. And this one is crying for medicine. So this one is about a hunter that went out hunting for a bear and he came across this bear and he noticed that it was kind of like falling around. It didn't look normal. So he thought, oh, I'm going to follow this bear. So he followed him to a cave, but he didn't want to go inside the cave. And so he, he lowered a slave in a basket into the, into the cave. And uh, when he pulled it up, first of all, there were flies that came up and then he put it down again and then frogs came up and then he put it down again and there's ants and then tallow 
but he never did get a hold of the bear. But he took all this and he said, ah, oh, I'm going to make medicine out of these things. So that's what he did. And he realized that when he went hunting and he took that medicine with him and would shake it, he would get whatever he wanted. In fact, he, he was rich. He became rich because he could have anything at all in his life. And his wife wanted him back. His estranged wife wanted him back. And it was like he thought to himself, well, you know, I can have any woman that I want, so I don't think I'm going to take her back because she wasn't very kind to me. So, and anyways, that medicine, when you see a young woman just crazy in love, the people would say, oh, you must have given her the crying for medicine potion. <laughs> I like that story. <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of like, boy, the things people go through, eh? <laughs> for love. <laughs> okay. Now this paddle, <clears throat> this one is titled A Woman That Was Stolen by the Shark People. And in the story, what it really attracted me to the story was the woman, the woman hanging onto the fin like the killer whale. Well, her and her husband were out camping, and the shark people came and captured her and stole her from him. And, you know, the strength that she had to have to endure being stolen and fought over, it was like she had to be pretty strong. So on the paddle, how I designed it, if you look at the whole total design, is the killer whale and the shark go in a wave. So that's what I had in mind was like the wave of the ocean. And um, you can see that there, kind of like that. And then there's the woman holding on to the fin. So that, that was the thought that I had about when I was designing it on paper. But I love the story because of the woman's strength. The things that women have to go through. <laughs> yeah. So well, that was for that. That's it for that one. Thank you, Dale. You're welcome. Okay. Sorry for cutting you off there. I didn't realize you weren't done. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. Okay, now we're on to Arlene's work. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Arlene Ness. I'm a Gitsan, and I'm from Wilpsebasa. And I am really just so honored and happy to be included in this um, very talented and inspiring group of women. You guys are just so amazing, and I'm really impressed by the work. Um, also, Joanne, I want to say thank you for the book. It's beautiful. It's wonderful work. And it really showcases the pieces just perfectly and our stories. Um, I started, like, I grew up in art, essentially, all my life. It's all I really, that was my escape. That was uh, the fun with my family, my siblings. It was uh, very much how I interpret life is almost through art. And when I started really focusing on learning Gitsan art, it was a very fortuitous. I lived where I live because there are so many great artists just, just in this one little area where I stay. And when I started, I wanted to know like all the, the ins and outs, the rules. I didn't want to break protocol. I didn't, I, like I wanted to know uh, the traditional part of doing Gitsan art. I grew up in, in the feast house and with my family and very involved and, um, you know, we're, it's, it's a language that I wanted to be fluent in is the artwork. And, um, you know, my first uh, instructors in school would have been people like Victor Mowat and Art Wilson. Um, and then when I went to school, my first instructor that, uh, you know, I never ever let go of was Vernon Stevens. He turned into a very great mentor. And um, 
you know, people like Phil Janzi, Earl Maldo, Walter Harris, Yaya Haidt, um, and then in further schooling, there's Dempsey Bob and Stan Bevan and Ken McNeil, and they've all really um, just helped me delve even further into the technicalities and the protocols and just the creativity of um, having my visions come out in whatever medium that I felt it needed to come out in. So it could be like the carving, the traditional carving, um, it could be painting and stained glass, you know, there's just so many ideas and it's, it's finding the right, the right medium. Like looking at what's on the other screen now, that's the bone carving that I did. And, you know, beginning of 2021 was a little crazy. And I didn't focus on going out to get the wood, the perfect carving wood in the spring, you know, right before the sap runs is when we go out to get the wood and we're out hunting, we're looking for trees that glow at you and want, you know, you know, they're going to be the perfect carving wood and you'd go through the all of the um, preparation. And we didn't get to do that in 2020. You know, everything was about preserving food and making sure if anything were to just go right off the deep end that we're prepared, my family's gonna have salmon preserved and everything like moose meat. So we got the moose and that was um, part of the preparation. And just at the end, we're cutting that moose bone and just that, that shin bone just glowed at me and uh, the, the upper part, it, it also really called to me. And I asked, well, can you guys cut this piece off for me? And they were like, yeah, I guess, sure. So, you know, I was holding the bottom part and someone Dude, else holding the top. Like this, that. <laughs> and it was, it was, um, it was hard work, you know, and nothing really ever is easy when you're doing traditional artwork because there's so much to prepare. And so my husband and my family, they were all, you know, kind of intrigued. What am I going to do with this bone? And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. It was, I just knew I was going to use it. So I, I cleaned it, I um, prepared it, and I had it in a freezer for a little while. And all of a sudden it just, you know, boom, it was in my head. It was like, it was always in the back. And then it jumped to the front. I had to interrupt what I was working on, put that aside and just take, go get that bone, let it defrost and start carving it. I didn't even have the idea fully, like, you know, I didn't do any preparation drawings. There's no little plan laid out. Like I'm gonna cut this this way here. Like I do with the totem pole. I just started carving and it was like, the story came out and it is a family story. Like um, it's on our totem pole and it's part of my adult. So I can't share with you the details, but I can share with you that it is an underwater scene and it, the figure in there is a transformative figure. It is a, um, it's spirit. So it's not male or female, it's just spirit. And it is part of the, the history in my family that, you know, of survival and uh, achieve had to go through this fantastic experience and uh, other characters in that experience is the white killer whale. So the bone just, you know, it's already the color I needed and I had the water flowing. I had the previous like images in my head for this is a cool shape or that's a really neat design. And I would like to incorporate that into whatever in the future. And, and here it just came out. and. Um, just to, to really highlight the treasure of life, like gold is considered valuable. So I, I did that tiny little gold um, oval in the center and I carved a human face design in that. And you'll see that the hand of the human is holding on to the, the pectoral fin of that killer whale. And also like, it's just kind of cradled right in between the, the blowhole and the hand so it's like protected 
and it's being protected from a potential devastation. So, you know, it all, all kind of comes together. You know, we want to protect ourselves from the devastation and everybody was scared in the beginning at March and that feeling like that worry for your family, for my children, you know, just, just wanting to do everything I could to prepare us to protect us. And that all came out in this little piece, this bone, this moose bone that feeds our family. So that was one remarkable piece. I'm really, really super happy with it. So before everything kind of uh, got internationally scary with the pandemic, um, our focus was on raising awareness and having our lands protected and our sovereignty acknowledged and in amongst and woven in all of that is the, the murdered missing um, indigenous women and men and um, just our people, you know, we are constantly aware of this, this danger that we live with, this worry for our loved ones and you know, in my community, there's a couple of people like at the time we were still looking for and it was fresh and the heartache is, you know, it's always refreshing. There's another one to worry about. There's another one to wonder about. So I was exploring um, digital art and I had this idea. I've always had it in the back of my mind that the forest I wanted to create pieces that that um, really told the story of how I view the forest as it's it's the cusp of our our being. It's it's our history. It's our culture, and it's where I felt the most um, embraced by my history and my ancestors. And you know, it was always just going home. You know going out mushroom picking, berry picking, going out for a walk, bringing the kids out to, you know, go cross country skiing, things like that. Um, and very much a part of our lives, very much a living figure for us is being on our territory, being in our forests and you know, knowing that it would take care of us. And, you know, so many mushroom pickers will get lost in there too. and. You know, everybody know where to kind of go look in their area and the whole community would come out and, you know, they would be found. And yet we have a whole population that are never found. And I wanted to layer that on top of this feeling of our forest. And um, so, you know, the technical aspects aside of working in layers and doing digital artwork and I just kept the female figure simple because you know I didn't want to focus on just one it's for all of all of the the souls that we are still looking for and wondering about and the designs on the side I chose different crest designs and um you'll see the wolf, the frog, and the grouse coming in on this side. And they kind of represent the spirits of our ancestors coming, coming to help and coming to comfort and coming to just, you know, be hopefully a positive, um, supportive type of entity for us. It's how I see them. Like they're not just nebulous and an idea. Like for me, they're, they are, they're right there all the time. And on the other hand, we have a bunch of stories in our history about the, the kind of darker side of things. So on the other side, I'll, you'll see a owl figure is a little bit more, you know, faded out and it's not really there. It's kind of transparent. And so for me, it isn't like anything in reality. It's more like this is what we have to protect ourselves against, like the negative forces. And uh, ancestors are more solid because for me, they, they are the strength, they're more real. And this, this um, canvas is called Stolen. I, I had other names for it, but when I looked at it, you know, I had that 
comforting forest, but other people might see it as scary and dark. For me, that's, you know, a soft place to land almost. And that's where our souls could return. You know, just another aspect to look at things. I don't want to say how to look at a piece of art because it's all subjective to whatever people see when they look at it. But um, for me, it's it's a very you know, heartbreaking yet hopeful piece because we all know we're going to reunite with our ancestors. Okay. So I do a lot of carving. I didn't actually start carving until 2006. I always thought I was not a woodworker because, um, you know, in high school, you do this little project and mine was really terrible. <laughs> it was not good. And um, I just figured, okay, woodwork's not for me. And um, I went to school for design. My intention was to learn proper Northwest Coast form line design at a you know structured setting and the first the first thing I had to do was carve a seal bowl because I started and the school was halfway through I had to a lot of catching up to do so really you know I, I started in in for me it was a pretty intimidating piece to do a seal bowl carving and um, working with Vernon Stevens he just seemed to know my language how to explain things and I learned so much in three months. It was such an intense learning time for me. I did a lot of research. I did a lot of like actual carving, learning by doing. And I researched my own family history. So when I did my first pieces, they were based on um, my history and my family's adult and um, traditional stories being told. And, you know, before all my schooling, I was all about drawing faces. I did pen and ink faces and pencil sketches, portraits. So I kind of veered into doing a lot of faces for my carvings too. And in here, you'll see the dark red cedar one. It's from um, a burn pile, that cedar. It was a beautiful large log. It was just so majestic and straight and clean and yet it was burned in half and covered by debris and brush and it was almost like they were trying to hide it and prevent someone from using this beautiful piece and you know we went out to a territory I had permission um Yaya Haidt actually arranged that little trip to go and get some carving wood and um we were going to be trekking through a bunch of trails and we come across this burn pile at the side of a logging sale and this beautiful wood. It's like we all just kind of mourned the fact that this could have been a totem pole. And we were standing there like almost in disbelief that we seen this like that. But um, we didn't just keep walking by. We, we took the two ends out of that pile we cut off the super charged, our charred, damaged pieces. Yaya took his and made beautiful artwork with his. And I'm, I still have some pieces from that. It was that big of a pole. And, um, you know, I've made other pieces that kind of tell the story of, of me coming across this beautiful carving wood in a burn pile. Um, you know, it's almost savage how it was just disregarded attempted to be destroyed like that and so it this particular piece was a little bit more dry than the rest so it was quite the challenge to carve and have a clean look to it and not all chipped and pieces coming off the end so and I had to take my time with it if I even hinted at going a little bit fast with my v-cuts a big piece would come off so I treated the wood um, happily, through the Frida Decent School, I did take um, totem pole preservation, and they had techniques that help preserve the wood, especially as it's been out in the elements. So I used some of that knowledge and treated this wood. And um, it's, you know, it's not going to go any further than what it is. It's, it's um, preserved. And yeah, it tells kind of that story. 
and her face, I did puffy eyes because I wanted it to kind of look like she had a good crying belt. <laughs> you women all know the puffy eyes. Um, so she has that. But she's kind of okay with things. She doesn't, have, she doesn't look heartbroken. She looks like, okay, now we can move on. We acknowledge this terrible thing and we're going to move forward and do something. And that's what this lady is. And I call her Oracle because I think for us, we do, we do tell the interpretations, these stories that are sent to us through, through the universe, you know, they're, they're all out there. and We're the ones that can snag that, that one part of the story, this one instance, and we put it down onto what we create. And this is my interpretation. And I use the killer whale design because that is one of our main crusts in my house. And I tend to kind of go to that area of uh, familiar designs. And this guy, we have these, these um, positions in each household. And, you know, they take the watchman. You now they sit on a certain part of the table and they're honored for that. But they also have that responsibility and we fully expect them to perform their duty. And that is to keep an eye on our territory and make sure that the incursions that are happening are not without consultation and um, consent. So I have a whole table full of warriors and we have a few leaders and, and we consider them our watchmen, not just the person who holds the name, but you know, our whole will does. And, you know, right now that's what we're dealing with about, you know, because things kind of happen when you're not watching. Um, licenses are are issued and they don't have consent. So I got a whole bunch of people up on our territory right now kind of asserting their sovereignty. And um, I did this for them. Like we're not just all by ourselves as, as uh, matriarchs or chiefs. We have a whole house. And this one figure represents a very strong portion of that. So I got the front lit on, and that's the grouse. That's another um, family crest. And interestingly, I used stained glass, not, not um, abalone in that. So that is um, opalescent, wispy stained glass. And it really looks like our abalone, which, you know, we can't send over, over the border because it's a controlled and prohibited thing to send and instead of using pala shell which is a brighter blue this one really reflect the traditional um our local mm. abalone shell yeah so and you know with all of my stained glass history i have a lot on hand that you know i could just choose and that one just was kind of sticking out from the rest and it was perfect so on the side of the face you'll see a hawk design drawn on it is just, you know, for the hunter's instinct and the keen eyesight. And I kind of relate that to hopefully some foresight for our warriors in our house that we're supporting right now and mm -hmm. wisdom. Thank you, Arlene. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. You're welcome. Thanks. Love your work. All right. So now we have Marie O'Gills, please. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Marie Oldfield. My traditional name is Wee Madik. Uh, my grandmother and my mother were uh, from Lachlalam's Port Simpson. Um, the robe that uh, that's here is a double-sided robe. Um, I started weaving probably 35 plus years ago uh, with one of my cousins, actually, Willie White and I have been, um, we took the same classes. We went up to the Totem Heritage Center and we learned from some of the most amazing artists. Um, and uh, he took his further and went into Chilkat. But the first time I ever did Raven's Tail, I was in love. That was it. My heart was 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 sold. I wasn't going to go anywhere else. I was going to stay 
with Raven's Tale. Um, at the beginning, I, I did um, the traditional, I followed all the traditional rules. I followed all the traditional protocol. Um, I did traditional pieces. I stuck by all the rules. And then as I progressed, some of the artists that I ran into challenged me to go outside the box. And I had a really hard time with it. Um, I knew that, uh, that I wanted to do contemporary pieces somewhere down the line, but I didn't think it would come as quickly as it did. Uh, this is a contemporary piece. I've always, when I first, one of the first things that I, that I said to myself after I was uh, weaving a few years was that I was going to do a few robes and one of them that was in my mind and in my heart was the double-sided robe. Uh, on, on one side is the, uh, there, there's balance in this robe. So it's male and female. The one side that is holding the copper is the male side. We have, or the talking stick, we have um, our men. Um, that speak for us. And that side, the one that's holding the copper, you'll see the labrette in her lip. That's the female side. Um, to me, what that represents is the balance that needs to be put back into our, our system and our ways of life. Um, we were balanced before. We had, we had traditionally, we had male and female, and they were equal power. They had equal say, they had equal rights. And um, so when I did this robe, that's what I was thinking of. Each piece that I, that I do, I, I, I think before I do it. Um, so the, you'll notice that um, the, the, the background or the main panel is is white it's it's just blank and it's a contemporary piece so it's going to be blank and the reason that it's blank is because there's kind of a story that goes with it um uh i need to acknowledge uh the design that's that is around those borders uh reg davidson did the design for me um, and then he brought it to two amazing women, uh, Val and Wendy Molescu, who actually cut out and did um, the side borders. I did the weaving and then we pieced it together. Um, so I want to acknowledge those three people. I want to acknowledge also uh, my family for, this is a family piece and I want to acknowledge my family for lending this robe for this show because I think it's an important an important um, piece to be in a show because as a weaver um, and as a woman artist, it kind of feels like we are doubled down when it comes to having to work extra hard for uh, to get our pieces out there and to get the stories of them out there so that people know who we are as a people and who we are as women. Um, when Joanne uh, approached me, I, the, this, this main panel was blank. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I heard her idea for, for the show. And so this design or what's on this robe will not make sense to anybody but the artist. And you'll see that there are three colors. There's white, there's black, and there's yellow. And then there is a ball of spun wool. The black uh, is, that represents, to me, that represents our history. Um, the, the, the darkness that, that came to visit us as people and as women. Um, that, you know, we all know that that includes 
residential school, 60 scoop day school. But to me, it also represents patriarchy mm -hmm. and all the stuff that it's done to devastate our place as women in our own culture and in the world. The yellow represents today. We have uh, our women and, and you know, our men are taking back and looking at how to repair the relationship between men and women and put us back in our place as equals in, in our own culture and as equals in the world, whether that's as human beings or as artists. Um, I have men who encourage me all the time to, uh, to produce pieces and to make statement, a statement as an artist. The white is, is tomorrow. That's, uh, that's our, that's, we decide where that goes. Um, we, you know, that's, that's our decision. So all of this craziness on this is how our culture, my interpretation of how our culture has been. It's been kind of all over the place. And as women, we've been kind of all over the place. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down in history. You know, we've been down. Um, today we're taking control. We're, we're, we're slowly moving up. Tomorrow is a whole new ball game. There's a ball of weft, which is, or there's a ball of warp that's hanging there. If you just scroll over, that's it right there. That, that spun warp. Um, that is just hanging there because to me, that represents the hope for the future. Yeah. We're going to decide where we go as a, not only as a people, but as women, where we stand with our artwork, where our artwork is going to go and how we're going to represent that in the world. So that's the piece. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. All right, now uh, we're going to talk with Pearl Innes about her work. Not sure where she went, Pearl. You're muted, Pearl. Sorry about that. Okay. Could you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, my name's Pearl Innes. I am a Sim Shan. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> I can't seem to get my video going, Joanne. That's okay. Okay. Um, I'm a Simshia Nishka Weaver. I have three pieces in the Bill Reed Gallery exhibit, uh, Hands of Knowledge. I'm very honored to be a part of this exhibit alongside of these very talented artists. I'd like to give special thanks to William White, my teacher, my mentor, for the knowledge you shared with me. I will be forever grateful. I wouldn't have been able to come this far without your guidance. For Joanne Findlay, I truly appreciate your continued support for the artist and works created from the heart. Mm. And to my family and friends for all your love and encouragement. In the past, our ancestors used the mountain goat wool in their Chilkat weavings. Today, most weavers use merino wool. And this is the wool I used for all these pieces. Um, the pieces are woven on a freestanding loom with no weight or tension. So the weaver controls her tension with just her hands. Um, the warps, which are the vertical hanging pieces of wool are thigh spun merino and cedar bark. 
And this usually takes many hours to do, as most weavers will tell you, just the preparing of the materials before you even start weaving and having your design and everything ready. So it is a very time consuming art. Um, my first piece is the Chilkat dance apron. And if you could zoom in on that. Uh, Ama Bess will dipneest. It is beautiful when we see it. It was my first major piece woven for my husband. It represents a killer whale and is danced and used culturally, culturally by himself and his tribe. I named it Ama Bess will dipneest because that's how I felt when I saw the old robes. I was in awe of how beautiful they were and I could feel the spirit of the robes and of our ancestors. And I felt the same thing after completing this apron. My second piece that I have in the show is a Chilkat potlatch bag. Gilks needs looking back. It's woven, it's a woven ancestor's face. Um, it's to be used as a side bag and you usually use it at cultural events and gatherings. Uh, this weaving is a connection to my ancestors. It reminds me of how we are always looking back to them for guidance along our journey in this life. Gilks needs. My third piece, the Chilkat headband, Raven Killer Whale Transformation. Uh, my husband took his daughter to be his sister, to be by his side to assist him with tribal duties. So she walks between two tribes, transforming from raven to killer whale and back again. This piece was woven to honor her for her achievements in her life. Um, I weave for the love of it, for our culture and for our people. And that's why I do what I do. Wonderful, wonderful work, Pearl. Thank you. All right. And last but not least, Kelly Clifton. Okay, let's see here. Um, it says I'm unable to start my video. The host has stopped it. <laughs> we can still hear you. Okay. All right. Amagari Suliach Statratni Snusum, Adziksum Gipeg Diwayu. Kelly Clifton Diwam Gramsiwayu, Ranhara Deep Degu, Hain Diwal Zahu at a Trashku Diwal Watku, Ab Lukul Doyer Satratni Snusum will got Goydexism, said Yatwan. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. My traditional name is Adziksum Gipeg, which means flying proud, and my um, English name is Kelly Clifton. I am a raven. My family comes from Hartley Bay and I live currently in Prince Rupert. And I just wanted to say thank you all very much for coming today. Um, I have a lot of people to thank, but I definitely need to acknowledge the Frida Deezing School and my instructors there, um, Dempsey Bob, Stan Bevan, Ken McNeil, Dean Heron, Latham Mack, and especially Dean who has continued to help me since I graduated there, I believe it was six years ago now. And thank you to Joanne for getting this group of incredible artists together. I feel um, very honored to be in such great company. So with that being said, um, I will move into speaking about my pieces. Uh, we can start with the one on the left there. So that one is called Supasam Sigidam Na'ach, which means young matriarch. And across the eyebrows, it reads Dim Gat Ledin Samatratni Sa, which means you all be strong each day. So when I created this mask, I was thinking about how many um, really powerful young Indigenous women are out there today doing really important work. And I know that it can be trying at times um, to do some of our cultural work. So I wanted to create a mask that was in dedication to these women and to honor them and to encourage them 
um, with what they were doing. Beautiful. This next one says, Gilamu doyachs atratni nakranenzitskum, which means I give thanks to all of our ancestresses or I give thanks to all of our grandmothers. And it has four figures, um, they're female figures, so you can tell by the librette. And to me, these four figures kind of represent different generations. And the middle figure um, was kind of my interpretation of birth, birthing, um, just bringing life into this world and honoring our ancestors really, and especially uh, the females and the roles that we play we are a matriarchal society, so I think it's really important to honor that. And yeah, I don't know if you can quite tell um, if you go closer to the painting, but there are some gold highlighted sections. I think it needs different lighting, but um, yeah, I think that to me just kind of brought in that spiritual aspect for me was the there's gold all along the outline and the librette and then in the middle. So this next piece is called Balach. And in our culture, um, Balach is essentially one of our ancestors who comes back to visit us through a young person. Um, we are all essentially one. So an example of this would be um, a toddler maybe saying something, having certain knowledge about an event that occurred maybe before they were born. And that's how we know that that's somebody coming back to show us that they're still here with us. I intentionally used the reverse side of the abalone shell and the eyes um, because I wanted that to represent kind of the inner spirit showing outwardly. And if you look at the top, there's two um, human or two faces. So those are representative of kind of ourselves and then our spiritual selves. And mm -hmm. I wanted the mask, I didn't want to give the mask a specific gender because I really wanted uh, the viewer to decide kind of who they saw when they looked at this mask. So as you can tell, all of these masks are really inspired by our traditional language, Samaliyah, which I've been learning for the past five years. Um, and I think it's such a crucial time to encourage everybody to really learn as much of our traditional language as possible. So with that being said, I would also really like to thank the Somaliac Language Authority, all of my incredible fluent speakers who have been teaching me over the years. Um, I think these pieces really represent my language learning and my experiences as an, as an artist and they're just um, blend two really beautiful uh, parts of our culture. So that's it. Thank you, Kelly. Well, thank you, everybody. That's been wonderful. And I guess I'll turn it back to you, Alia. Yeah, thank you so much. I've loved hearing all of the uh, stories behind all of your work. I've gotten so familiar with it over the last few months, but it's always so great to hear your own voices behind it and talking about it a little bit more. So thank you so much. Um, so we are at the end of our opening now. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today and for uh, listening to the artists speak themselves and talk about their artworks. We will actually also be having a panel discussion on June 12th if you'd like to join us and the artists will get a chance to talk a little bit more about their own artwork and their practices a little bit more in depth. Um, we also have a uh, our catalog here. We have it our, in our gallery shop. If you want to come in and see the show, you can also pick up the catalog. Um, yeah, it's also sorry. What online? It's also available. Oh, the catalog is also available online. <laughs> Um, so we are open Wednesday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So for those who are in the Vancouver area, you can definitely come down and see the show in person. It's it's one thing to see it online, but it's another thing to see it in person. Everything here is so beautiful. Um, but I'd love to thank everybody, or want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much for Joanne and all the artists for uh, joining us for the conversation. Thank you. Been wonderful. Thank you.